Johnson, and I am the Vice President for the Fifth Judicial Circuit of the Puerto Rican Bar Association of Florida. Uh, very happy to see everybody here and very proud that everybody has taken this so seriously to celebrate Puerto Rico Day this year. Our panel, which is the second of the day, is entitled Impact of Mass Influx on Florida's Education, Housing, and Healthcare Systems. I have a distinguished panel with me and I will ask you to help me welcome them today. Um, right next to me is Lorraine Troll. She's a senior policy advisor with the National Council of La Raza. And then I have Lydia Escobar. She's a teacher with the Osceola County Public Schools. We also have Johanna Lopez. She's a world language instructional coach with Orange County Public Schools. And last but not least, we have Anitza San Miguel. She's the Dean of Sciences from Valencia College in Osceola. <laughs> Welcome, ladies, and thank you for being here. If we could have silence in the room, please, so we could listen to our panelists. Um, on education, which is the first topic of this next hour, um, as a background, we know that federal law through the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, uh, which was signed into law in December of 2015 by President Barack Obama, reauthorized an older act, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, and made significant updates to the law. There had been no changes made to this older act since 2001 when No Child Left Behind uh, was enacted. Particularly, the 2015 act modified the accountability requirements of the old act by requiring states and state agencies to hold schools accountable based on the results of statewide assessments, multiple measures such as the school quality, student success, and student growth, among other things. Report cards and consolidated state plans are now subject to different requirements, including timeliness, etc. We will start with Loren. Um, briefly, I know you have a presentation to give us but I wanted you to, to um, briefly tell us the National Council of La Raza's perspective on how the ESSA has been used or can be used as a tool to assist students who come to the USA from abroad and who do not have English as a first language and how are the different states from your perspective or your organization's perspective helping Latino students and Puerto Rican students in particular, if you can elaborate, to succeed under ESSA. Sure. Hi, I'm Loren. Um, thank you for having me. And I will cover some of this question in a little more detail towards the end of my um, presentation. But the states have a real opportunity, especially around English learners, to serve them better and to be held accountable for how they're serving them through the Every Student Succeeds Act. One of the major improvements was moving accountability from Title III into Title I for the English language proficiency indicator. And so now if you are not serving your English learners well, your, your school and district, it'll show on the state summative rating system, however your state decides to do that. Um, since states are currently in a position where they're either developing their state plan or they have already submitted uh, some in April, we're seeing that being done in a different, a couple different ways. And uh, NCLR as well as other groups at the federal civil rights level are trying to work with our local partners to make sure that what's going on the books isn't there just to be in compliance, but is actually being done well. So how is your English language proficiency indicator weighted in your summative rating system? What does your entrance and exit procedures for identifying ELs and reclassifying them look like um, so that we can have a better landscape or a better standardization across the state? both in Florida, but everywhere else. So those are some of the, like I said, I'll go into a little more detail, but those are some of the opportunities that we see. Um, as far as Latino students and Puerto Rican students more broadly under ESSA, uh, we still have maintained the requirements that data has to be disaggregated by race and ethnicity, so you can't hide how you're serving a certain group of students. Um, so that we think is very important moving forward. But now one of the major changes is that there also has to be state action or targeted intervention, even if you're not serving students well, one group of students well. So if there is a district or school system that is only under serving Latino students, it's no longer okay to say, but we're doing, we're doing well with everyone else so we can move on. There has to be a plan for targeted action and improvement to um, increase the achievement of those students specifically. 
All right, and you want to start with your presentation? <clears throat> sure. Um, so just to quickly, we'll look at the overview of Latino students in our public school systems, um, how students are doing on achievement, Latino students specifically. Um, I had some brief information about ESSA um, that was covered, so we might be able to skip over that, and then Florida's opportunity with their state ESSA plan. So one of the questions that we hear is, you know, why invest in education for Latino students? I think the first answer, which is my favorite answer, is it's the right thing to do. We have an obligation to serve all students well and give all students a high quality education that paves the road, paves the road to success, whether it be in college or career. The second part of that answer, though, is that how we serve our Latino students and their successes or their failures in our public schools really leads a path for how we are gonna do it as an economy and as a country in the future, specifically because of the population of students in, in our public education system. One in every four students in the public school classrooms are Latino across the country. That holds true also here in Florida where it hovers around 24%. We have five million English learners in our schools. Um, in Florida, that's about 12% of your total enrollment. Uh, in Florida, it's about 73% have a home language of Spanish, and it's about the same nationally, around 77%. Also, if you look at population projections, Latino students are the fastest growing segment of the youth population. By 2030, they'll make up just over 33% of our population. So their success and their failure is an indicator of how our schools are doing, but also how we'll prepare our workforce moving forward. Um, how, are, how are Latino students doing in schools? Well, we do have some gains that should be celebrated. Over the past 15 years, we've seen some increase in improvements on national assessments in both reading and math. Uh, the high school dropout rate is about half of what it was in the early 90s. Also, the graduation rate is hovering around 76%, which is a record high. The college going rate is three times of what it was in the 70s, and the gap is narrowing between Latinos and their white peers in their college enrollment rate. And then Latinos are earning a bachelor's degree at higher rates than ever before. So that is the foundation for where we are, and we want to build on that momentum, you know, have the wind at our back and keep pushing more and more of our students. There are more gains to be made, though. Um, despite being the fastest growing segment of the child population, Latinos have the lowest enrollment in early childhood education. So that's about 44% of three to four year olds are enrolled um, in comparison to 56% of their white peers. Also, while gains have been made on national assessments, if you look at the 2015 assessments, we only have about 79% uh, of Latino students reading at proficiency. And when you disaggregate that out by English learners, that skyrockets to 91% are reading below proficiency. Um, also, the investments in education for Latino students is not equal to their white peers. So what does that mean? It's an act, you can put an actual dollar amount on it. On schools where the population is 90% or more students of color, they spend about 70, $733 less per student than schools that have a population of 90% or more white. So there are actual, actual difference in fiscal investments in, um, in students. And then um, while the gap is narrowing and we do have Latino students going to college at a greater rate than ever before, a gap still exists. Um, about 56% of Latinos earning their degree within six years and 63 of their white peers. Sorry, my, my eyes are failing me right now. So that's where we are. We've done well, but we have more gains to be made. So the context in which there's an opportunity for those gains to be made are the, is the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, at least at the state level. And so how we got there quickly, um, as it was said, we had no child left behind that put in a system of adequate, adequate yearly progress and expected all students to reach proficiency by 2014. Despite being on the books for nearly 15 years, uh, No Child Left Behind never had great support or buy-in at any level, really. But there are some parts of it that were a success and are important for us to maintain. One is the robust accountability system, um, holding schools accountable for what's happening, and also making data available for different student subgroups, so reporting data by race and ethnicity so that we can see what's going on. During the era of No Child Left Behind, the Obama administration did issue waivers that provided some relief if you were willing to adopt some favored policies of the administration. So things like teacher evaluation system based on outcomes. 
But in 2015, uh, reauthorization came around and the Every Student Succeeds Act was signed into law in December 10th of 2015. And so I think two, the two big points to remember is that it did maintain this accountability students, this accountability system that wants to ensure that all students count and that there's action attached to that data that we're seeing out of those systems. But the second and the newer part of it is that it put a lot of flexibility back to the states and gave states the opportunity to create accountability plans that take into the state-specific context and did not have such a heavy hand in the federal role. Um, some highlights specifically for improvements around English learners, which I touched on briefly, but just to go through. You now have to have state goals for increases in the percentage of students who are achieving proficiency. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As I said, the English language proficiency indicator was moved from just Title III to Title I. So now that must be part of your school rating system. And that's the first time that that's ever been done. There's, now there's a requirement for standardized entrance and exit requirements on EL. So within 30 days of enrolling in school, a student must be assessed as to whether they're an English learner. And that procedure must be uniform across the state. So that is to try to combat the fact that some some schools and districts do this really well and others do not, and kind of level the playing field for the experience that a student has when they first enroll in school. Also, um, there was an increase in the authorization for Title III funding, which is the federal funding for English language acquisition. It was the second largest increase um, in authorization levels in that bill. Also, disaggregation of data by um, ELs with disabilities. So there have been issues in the past where students were mislabeled that's one part of it. But the other part is that maybe you were serving English learners well, maybe you were serving students with disabilities well, but English learners with disabilities you were not serving well. So we'll be able to have data on those students and see how the states and districts are going. And then lastly, reporting on long-term EL. So having real data on what are the number of students that are being classified as an EL for longer than four or five years, what, what is happening to where that's the case, and what can we do to move them into English proficient. Some other equity improvements that go beyond just English learners is that um, ESSA maintains and improves the language around parent and family community engagement. And so that means making sure that through the development of your state plan, which should be going on in Florida right now, that there are requirements to engage with various stakeholders from NCLR's perspective. That means engaging with parents who may be limited English proficient parents and figuring out ways that you can make contact with and get meaningful um, feedback from maybe parents or communities that previously have not felt welcome in that process. Um, also, the accountability for the achievement of all students, which we talked about with disaggregation of the data. Easily accessible data, we'll wait to see what that looks like in the field, but the idea is that if parents can get on and see how their schools and their districts are going, it provides an opportunity for parents to make decisions that are best for their students and also engage with the schools. And then equitable resources around highest needs students. So this idea that we know students with higher needs need better resources and often more resources to make things equitable and not just equal. Um, I got my two minute warning. So quickly, these are NCLR's equitable ESSA implementation pillars. They um, just kind of summarize the things that we just talked about. So maintaining high standards for students, we think that's important one to signal to the students that we know you can do this, but also hold the schools accountable for getting them there. Making sure the English learners um, are counted in a way that matters, so in their summative rating system and around targeted action. Um, and then I think also we'll be looking a lot on plans that have a focus on closing the achievement gap. So not just telling us what the gap is, but what are you gonna do to close it? And then this is just a summary of where the states, as, as Florida plans for their um, ESSA state plan that should be submitted in September, what are the things that we think are important to Latino students and English learners, and where are the places that advocates and parents and communities can engage? Um, one is determining those goals. What should be the goals for your students on academic achievement? and on English language proficiency. You don't want to set the goal too low and signal that we don't have high expectations, but it also needs to be a reasonable, attainable goal. 
indicator weighting. So we say that the ELP indicator has to be used if you're putting it in as only 2% of your overall rating, that's probably not sufficient. We suggest that the weighting should reflect what your population looks like. Um, what is the non-academic indicator? So is your state gonna use chronic absenteeism or some other indicator of school climate? And is that being reported in a way that really reflects your students and your children's experience in that school? Um, subgroup accountability, so making sure that we stay away from super subgroups. What do I mean by that? By saying, this is how white students are achieving, and then all other groups, <laughs> and grouping black students, Latino students, native students all in one, so we can't see um, at, a, at a more detailed level how our students are being served. Uh, locally designed interventions, so when this data shows that you are serving or not serving a student well, what does that intervention look at like? You should be putting input there, your state should be detailing those plans and having a real action plan on how to tackle that. And then lastly, parental engagement. Um, you know, it is on us and on our community to push for materials to be provided in Spanish, for meetings to be held in spaces where people, despite their um, immigration status feel welcome to come and engage and in a variety of ways whether it be on the internet or via phone or in person that we can cover the scope of people and what their capability is to engage so that is that thank you okay. I think, okay. so the next um, speaker Johanna Lopez correct um, she's a world language instructional coach and she has some perspectives from Orange County. Well, my perspective is from the Puerto Rican community. And the Puerto Rican community in there. More than Thanks. from Orange County Public Schools. Okay, great. Okay. Buenos dias. Good morning. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be here today. As Puerto Ricans, we have been part of this nation and for hundreds of years, we have lived here, we have fought for this country, we have worked hard and contributed to the economy and growth of United States of America. We have the knowledge, expertise, and education to obtain leadership positions in the field of education. But sadly, it is almost impossible for our community to achieve this goal in Florida. Even with the majority of the Latino population is Boricua. We need more initiatives to encourage and advocate for our Puerto Rican professionals in the field of education so they could achieve administrative positions. Today, I am not talking on behalf of Orange County Public Schools. I am speaking on behalf of thousands of Puerto Rican professionals that are living in financial hardship because due to the lack of resources that would empower them to demonstrate their full potential. Why do we have high quality Puerto Rican teachers in low salary jobs when we know that we are facing a shortage in the teaching profession in Florida? In addition, do you know that the Puerto Rican teacher certification is equivalent and transferable to Florida's teacher certification? However, even after they have acquired their Florida certification, they are not being hired as teachers. I believe that there are a misunderstanding on our academic and professional backgrounds here in Florida. Do you know that the Department of Florida is working in collaboration with the Embassy of Spain in order to get more teachers to Florida? Then I also ask you, what can we do to help the thousand of Puerto Rican teachers that already living in Florida and have not been hired? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? to help the teachers that are unemployed in Puerto Rico because of the economical crisis. For example, other states like Texas, California, 
Pennsylvania, and Kentucky have gone to the island to offer employment opportunities and monetary incentives to Puerto Rican teachers. I am a teacher here in Florida since 1998. I study in Puerto Rico. My bachelor's and master's degree are from Puerto Rico. I became the first Hispanic Teacher of the Year in Orange County Public Schools yes. along thank you, with several state and national awards. My educational background is 100% from Puerto Rico public education system. Based, thank you. Based on this, why our outstanding teachers are struggling too much to get a fair job, please? If I did it, I know they can do it as well. Please help them. Please believe in them. On the other hand, we are constantly asking why Puerto Ricans are not voting. The reason for this is that most of our people are not voting because they are tired of promises without solutions. I have never heard a politician talk about the Puerto Rican teachers' unemployment. Likewise, it is not mentioned our Latino brothers and sisters that are working because of DACA and are also in risk of losing that benefit as a result of losing their job as well. Definitely, we are growing in numbers and it is imperative to both parties to listen to our needs. We need to work together as a team in order to achieve employment fairness and an equity for our Hispanic teachers. Ahora, estos minutos, gracias. Como me quedan dos minutos, lo voy a decir en español. Yo creo que nuestros maestros puertorriqueños que están certificados están totalmente capacitados para ejecutar esa profesión y yo creo que sería un beneficio no tan solo para los maestros puertorriqueños, sino también sería un gran beneficio para Florida, porque obviamente la necesidad y el crecimiento de nuestros estudiantes puertorriqueños necesitan tener una conexión cultural con esa persona que les está enseñando para que se sientan más identificados y el producto sea aún mejor en términos de graduación y en términos de lo que el niño eh, logre en el salón de clase, no tan solo académicamente, sino también en conducta. Y el triunfo y el fruto del beneficio mutuo en la Florida se puede observar si esto se logra. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, for that very empowering opponent. That was perfect, and to add to that, I wanted to say that what we're doing here on Puerto Rico Day is probably part of the solution that Johanna is proposing. We need to bring this to the attention of the stakeholders and the legislators that are here listening to us. The more of us that show up and raise our voices, the more that this message can be sent out. Um, I like to focus on um, solutions rather than just pointing out the problems. We need to be practical. And all of the community organizations that normally join the Puerto Rican Bar Association are the heart of the action. Because the legislators can listen to us, can try to propose things. Obviously, there's political party opposition. Not everything that they propose gets passed into law. But really, whatever passes into law, it's at the community with the government agencies, but in great part, the community grassroots organization that put everything into effect and that end up helping the community more directly. So I think it's a great step that everybody's here and that your voices could be heard so that we can actually put action into all of our concerns. Thank you. Next is Lydia Escobar. She's a teacher in Osceola County, part of the public school system, and she has some perspectives to give us as well as a presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. I am from Puerto Rico. And I work, and I have worked um, for school districts in Puerto Rico, in Dallas, Texas, and also here in Florida. I work for Valencia Community College also. Partner here, is it? For um, an initiative that was for students to complete high school. 
I also work for charter schools, like life skill centers. Now, the last few years, I've been working for Kissimmee Middle School, and I'm gonna talk in behalf of the students. I know that teachers, are, it's, it's really low pay job. And we have a lot of sacrifices, things that we need to buy with our own money, things that technology that we need to bring to the class and help the students. But it's because we do it with the heart. That's why we are teachers and that's why we are here for. Thank you. Okay, so my presentation is gonna be, like I said, the perspective of the students. And I was asked to talk about the students in Osceola School District. And I work for Kissimmee Middle School, like I said a few minutes ago. Um, here is my biography, so you can see my background. Um, I'm a language arts and reading teacher at Kissimmee Middle School. I work for ESOL students or English learners. And uh, I also was Florida Reading Association Middle School teacher for the year 2015. I also was Kissimmee Middle School teacher for the year 2016. And I was finalist and one of the top 10 best teachers in the Osceola School District for 2017. I was also finalist on the Mujeres Destacadas 2017 La Prensa newspaper by Central Florida. I also talked for WIDA Consortium and also do speeches for Florida Reading Association in behalf of the students and the way they learn. I also teach and train teachers on how to help language learners, the English language learner students. So my focus is on learning English as a language. My presentation will be about uh, the arrival of students from Puerto Rico, the unique characteristics of the ESOL students or English language learners, the demographics of our students, the English language learners program, the needs that we have in our system, and what about the future of our students? Now, from the influx that we have from Puerto Rico to Osceola, there are some interesting facts. According to the United States Census of 2010, there were 47.8 of population were Hispanic or Latino. And the race in which majority is Puerto Ricans. So, and 25% of the population are the largest ancestral group in Osceola district. In 2000, 17% of the population in Osceola was from Puerto Rico. So we can see an increase from 17% to 47.8%. According to the census of 2014, they reported that there are 300,000 Puerto Ricans living in Central Florida. Students from Puerto Rico are unique. And I tell you that I have the opportunity to work with them, especially learning English, and they come with these characteristics that represent us. And one of them is the cultural identification. Supersedes everything else. And I quote this from Diana Peña and her study. Um, and my students, I can see any of my students. And they say, where are you from? I'm from Puerto Rico. Yeah, yes, I am from Puerto Rico. <laughs> but if you tell a student, where are you from? I'm from Venezuela, you know, and they are like a little, apprehensive about saying where they come from. But students from Puerto Rico, oh my God, they are the best students at all. According to the American Institute for Research, Puerto Rico has been excluded from explorations of dropout prevention in schools and communities. Wow. And for me, that is a concern. When I was doing my doctoral research with Nova Southeastern University, I worked for life skill centers, and that was for dropouts students who didn't complete the high school, they were able to complete the high school through the special program. And one of my concerns when I was doing my research, because I did my research with them, it was, um, and I remember, a citation from one research that says that to impact the students' dropouts and help them continue to higher education, you need to go level down to middle school. And that's what I did. 
I leveled down from high school to middle school because I want to impact those students. And this where this last three years I've been working only for middle school. And I can see the students that come reluctant to learn, reluctant to speak English. And at the end of the year, or not even at the end of the year, three months later, they are moved to the general program with English speakers, students. Thank you. Now, I will talk about a little bit about the ELL gifted and talented student. I think there is a need for an ELL program for gifted or students who have talents because we are losing those students. We are losing them in the, they only speak Spanish. They are no English language um, fluent. And I believe that we need to work. That's a need that we need to work on. Now, I have some um, slides about Hispanic demographics. So you can see the Hispanic demographics here for Osceola County. I'm gonna move this a little faster. Uh, this is the desegregation of data from 67,663 students in Osceola schools, 61% of them are from Puerto Rico. And from the 99 participants of the ELL program, 40% left the program, but we still have 59% of our students in ELL classes. Now, from my school, Kissimmee Middle School, we are 78.9%. Hispanic, and I'm gonna tell you, I think we are 90% Hispanic because some of these students that come from other places, they start speaking for, uh, Spanish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm gonna wrap up. <laughs> so I'm gonna move here. Uh, the two languages that speak in Osceola is Spanish and Arabic. And it's very interesting how 54 schools have more than 50% students who speak Spanish. Now, we provide two services, the one-way program and the two-way program. These are bilingual, to create bilingual or biliterate students. And here are some of the services that we provide to the program. Shelter class, dual language, is especially bilingual professionals, uh, many others. But these are the needs that I need I need because I'm speaking for the kids, for my students. We need more technology. Our students work with technology 100%. And they don't, they, some of them didn't know even how to turn on a computer. I'm sorry, but I had to tell you about this, okay? And we need technology not only in the school, because I have computers in my school, at home. And we need to work on that. These students need computers at home, these students need programs to um, learn English, and these students need also Wi-Fi connections at home because many of them doesn't have the resources to get internet. Wow. We need more English classes for parents and family. Also, they need English classes. We need motel and hotel partnerships. Many of our students are living in hotel and motels, and that is a shame. We need to provide the students of housing, and we need to provide the students a safe and secure environment. We also need some more social work services. We need to increase the bilingual books in our schools. We need to increase the funds for after school and tutoring program, because those students, we don't want them on the streets. We want them learning. I believe after school programs had to be in place and we need to increase funds for more paraprofessionals for EL program. This is my presentation, and I, like I told you a few minutes ago, I talk for the students. Thank you. Yes. For the after school program? Actually, I, I run, I'm part of the after school program. We provide tutoring and we provide helping for the um, state assessments, like the FSA program. And the, we need more. We need more time and we need more resources. We need more teachers. 
and we need sure. to make it longer because okay. they only do it like for two or three months and then they stop. But we need an after school program that continues the, the whole year and even during the summer. Thanks for the answer. Thanks for asking. So, sorry if I could weigh in real quickly. I think you, are you referring to the 21st Century Community Learning Center's funding? That, oh, okay, all right, because that funding has also been proposed to be cut at the federal level um, from the president's budget, yeah. So one way to engage is with Congress and letting them know the mm -hmm. number of Latino students, the number of Puerto Rican students that would be impacted and how they will be impacted by cuts to the after school programs. Exactly. Because that president's budget is not a final budget. Congress still has the ability to fund those programs, and they should fund those programs. So over the summer, engaging in that process is one way to, to combat that. All right. We'll try to address questions at the end of the session as well. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly that both Johanna and Lydia have been Teachers of the Year. So yes. congratulations on that. Thank you. And then our last panelist. Anitza San Miguel will give us some perspective, and I wanted just to pose a question to her. Once these students reach the uh, institution, your institution and that higher education level, how are you dealing with the educational needs of Latino students, but specifically Puerto Rican students? Well, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here, um, not only representing Valencia College, but I also represent as well the, the Puerto Rican community. I'm 100% Puerto Rican, born and raised in Levitan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> Um, but I'm also representing the scientific community because I'm also a scientist myself. Um, so I'm wearing three different hats um, today. Um, Valencia has embraced and has been embraced by Central Florida's Hispanic um, community. We believe that actually together we can change students' lives and change the future of Central Florida. Um, we have various um, academic programs um, and initiatives actually that are in place right now. Some that are just developing and others that are basically starting early um, conversations with key stakeholders. But just want to mention a couple of them. Um, Valencia's God College Initiative, which aims to increase the percentage of Osceola County High School graduates who attend college. That was recognized back in September uh, 2015 as a bright spot in Hispanic education by the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics. Valencia partnered with the Educational Foundation of Osceola County and the Osceola County School District on this initiative, which began back in 2013. Um, 2012, um, Valencia's Direct Connect to UCF program, not sure if you're aware of our Direct Connect program, where students start their two years at Valencia College, and then they have guaranteed admissions at UCF. Um, that was selected by Excelencia in Education as the nation's top national program for increasing academic opportunities and success for Hispanic students at the associate level. Valencia currently ranks fourth in the nation in the number of degrees awarded to Hispanic students and sixth in the number awarded for African Americans. Valencia's East and Osceola campus, and I'm based at the Osceola campus, um, it's actually um, have both been recognized by the federal government as Hispanic serving institutions in 2015, and Valencia College was awarded a 5.25 million grant by the U.S. Department of Education to expand educational opportunities on campuses where Hispanics and other minorities make up a large portion of the student body. So having said that, we also have a different initiative called Camino to UCF. Again, this is a cohort-based program where students um, basically who are interested in psychology, social sciences, and business um, you know, are recruited, start the program, cohort based throughout, they take all their classes together, they have curricular, extracurricular activities with their group and they're exposed to us. The idea is so the student is a Valencia student, but they can start feeling part of being the U, a UCF student as well. Um, and they got mentors and they bring activities where they can enhance their different programs. Um, as well, we also have LSAM. Um, we're also working in terms of doing um, research, recruiting Hispanic students, right? STEM is a big gateway out there. Some students, I see students in my office that tell me every now and then, I can't do biology. My first question is why? Right? Why? 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 You have this passion. Why don't you pursue it? Because sometimes the minute they find a roadblock doesn't mean that they turn behind and said, I can't do this. So I try to help them and just 
giving a quick example, had a student one um, came to my office, she happened to be, um, she had relocated from Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico um, to Orlando, and along her way, she had many roadblocks. And she's like, look, I've taken all these classes. Why they, they, don't, they don't transfer, right? So I sat down with her one by one. How can we help her, right? How can we then, I, uh, being able to have her meet with one of our advisors to sit down with her one on one and look through her transcript and say, how can we then you know, give you some credit for these classes and then take you to the correct class, whether it be nursing, so on and so forth. So we try to, you know, we have advisors at the college that can meet with the students, right? And they can help them with that class, but we need for them as well to come and, you know, be part of that conversation as well. For our new students who are actually coming to um, our campus where our new student orientations, we're actually trying to have also um, seminars and talleres de becas as well and information in Spanish Part of the Osceola campus uh, plan for the next five years is to develop and actually translate some of our documents in, in terms of the steps to enrollment, the Florida residency, and information that will be as also available in Spanish. We do know the students might understand, right, exactly what they need to do, but the parents don't, right? The parents need that information as well so that they can help in guiding. We know that parents are also key to that success for the students as well. So we're making that possible and trying to get all some of those key um, documents translated in Spanish as well um, to make that available. Um, one key point I also want to mention um, for Poinciana campus, right? Opening fall, we're very excited. We know the Poinciana community, right, is highly um, Puerto Rican. There's a lot of Puerto Ricans living in the Poinciana, so they'll have Valencia College. Um, we actually registered our first student a couple of weeks ago, I think it was last week, um, and all first-time students will be receiving uh, a scholarship, right, um, who will be starting at Poinciana. So Poinciana will be another gate that will be open. Students normally by car, take by bus, I believe it takes them around two hours to get to the Osceola campus, 45 minutes by car. So having a campus right at Poinciana uh, will help them make that and succeed in education. So we're very happy um, about that. And they'll have all the full services, tutoring, science classes. We're, it's a cohort-based programs as well. So students, when they register, they'll be registering for an Allied Health program or a business program, so a culinary, culinary program as well. So there's different opportunities for there. So just as a wrap up, right, key, um, education is key. Um, I know that for myself, having had my bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Puerto Rico, um, having had the opportunity, like I told my parents, you know, I'm going one year to do an internship at the NIH, I'll see you guys next year. Well, 19 years later, <laughs> I'm still here. Um, however, the road was not easy, um, just moving, but the persistent having the mentors in place and that's key for students who are coming to Valencia and other institutions as well is to try to find a mentor. A mentor doesn't necessarily have to be yes a professor but sometimes could be your advisor, it could be your friend, it could be your mother, your father, different key people that you meet along the ways and for me that made the big difference having mentors who guided me and told me you can do this and then deciding to do a master's in biotechnology because science was my passion and that I said I could make a difference in education, then leading to a doctor degree in higher education administration. And along that path, um, I had to take several steps backwards, right? And sometimes we think that the key to success, we go directly, but sometimes it takes us to different directions and sometimes we have to take steps back. Sometimes we feel that we have been demoted. Um, because of that journey, but at the end of the day, the success and the key is very critical. At the end, it's delight, and now I can say that being at Valencia, being a dean of science there, um, has opened a lot of doors, not only for me, but also for the students in our campus as well, because they feel they can come to the office, and they can find, finally they see my 
you know, my little Puerto Ricans, the things I have, they're like, oh, you speak Spanish? I said, yes. It's like, oh, thank God. I can finally, <laughs> I can finally express myself. And then in my case, I can, you know, I can guide them throughout the way. So education is key. Um, that's, I, one of my mentors told me once, life can take everything away from you except who you are as a person and your education. That's all it is. Thank you. Thank you. We've run out of time for this panel. We may have just one minute for one question, and then we have to move on to our next topic. Any questions for the panelists? I have a question, but I'm addressing your and your uh, concern about parents being involved. Uh, I've been involved with the Mexican American community, the Puerto community, the drug addiction community, the after school program community on the ground level. And I understand that a huge problem is that cultural divide. You have people who are coming from a totally different cultural background into the American culture, and the children are trying to assimilate and go forward, and the parents are not knowing what to do, what's right, what's wrong, where to go. And my thing is, why doesn't the educational system bring the parents in by doing things that the parents can identify with, like say, we have fiesta patronales, we have fiesta intelectuales, invite the parents into the school for a party. Come and eat, come and be a part, come and see your child's school as a party, not as like we're going to sit down and see no pressure. Bring them in and make them part of the educational process in a way that they can identify with immediately. If you feed them, they will come. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you, that was a question, last can suggestion. I, can I talk yeah. about that a little bit? In, in our school, Kissimmee Middle School, we have the SAC meetings that we need to partner with the, with the, the parents come to school. Um, we changed a little bit that trans transition, so what we're doing right now is we are offering a pizza night for the parents. The parents come with, the whole family comes. Uh, we also partnered with uh, the science centers from Orlando, and they brought the science night Mm -hmm. And even my granddaughter was there with the kids and the other parents. And the parents just, like you said, when they come to school and they see what we're doing with our students, they feel appreciated. And they said, you know what? Whatever you need in the classroom, whatever you need, you let me know. You call me. The parents come and bring flan, arroz con gandule, pernil, yes. When I was running the multicultural club, we did an activity. And you should see, I, I have pictures here that you should see even a cake with a Puerto Rican flag on it, like this big from one parent. And they were the highest people, they are the highest people to participate in school. We just need to motivate them to come to school, like yeah, you were saying sure. a few minutes ago. Yeah. Yes. And Thank I just thanks you. We ran out of time. I'm sorry. We have to move on to the next topic, just, which is housing, um, but there's we, an announcement. I just want to take a second to recognize Cecilia Figueroa with Darren Soto, Congressman Darren Soto's office, who've been, who's been organizing Puerto Rico Day for eight years. Thank Gracias, you. Cecilia. Thank you I to really our panelists. You this was joining very, us today. very instructional. <laughs>